Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and in this video we're going to be going over a recent interview that Naoki Yoshida did with the website GameWatch. Now, as their interviews are in Japanese, we have to thank Slicer for his translation over on the Blue Garter forums. He's done a ton of translations, we've referenced them in a bunch of videos here on the channel, so be sure to check for the source in the description of the video. Now, there is a lot of stuff we're going to skip around here because it's stuff that's got kind of like fluff answers, and honestly, it's stuff that would probably be better seeing in the first place. For example, this first section here, all about the story. The one big detail we can take away is right here in the first question, uh, where they mentioned that the Doma story is going to be divided into two parts, 4.2 and 4.3. So keep in mind, we're going to be, ex unlike with Alamigo, where we had like the one patch after we wrapped up 4.0, uh, this one's going to get two patches in a row, so expect this to be a story that does not conclude right in patch 4.2. Not that the story ever concludes, but you know what, you, you kind of know what I mean when I talk about that. They talk about Asahi Sas Brutus, they talk about um, the Phantom Train, which, you know, we already know is the first boss of the Sigma Escape, so there's not really much to stay hidden there. They talk about the uh, uh, ninjas that have hidden villages in Yanja and asks about main story. It, basically, Yoshida doesn't want to say anything. He'll correct them in certain cases and be like, oh, there's a few tricks in the trailer. So uh, you'll understand once you actually play. But there's not a whole lot to take away from this first section. The next section is about uh, the Forbidden Land Eureka. Now, February 10th, we're getting a live letter about the Forbidden Land of Eureka, specifically the first zone, the Animos. And of course, a lot of people are still trying to figure out well, what what is it? What really is Eureka the Forbidden Land? First of all, he would like to reiterate that it's separated from the Crystal Tower in terms of story and lore. Uh, but there is stuff about what it actually is, what Eureka itself is. Um, in regards to where it fits in Final Fantasy XIV. So we will learn a lot more about Eureka when it actually comes out, but it's not directly related to the story of the Crystal Tower. For now. Specifically says, for now. Um, so, not to compare it with Final Fantasy III's Eureka, where you fought weapons to get weapons, uh, the general idea of Eureka is still going to be about strengthening your weapons and your armor. He, again, reiterates, it is not like Palace of the Dead. Uh, it's more like a field area. So is it like Diadem? No, it, it'll feel similar in some ways. You do enter through the Duty Finder, so it's not like a full-blown field area. But one big thing is that your party can be changed freely at the destination. So you can go in with eight, you can go in with four, you can go in with one. You can join parties while you're there, you can play solo. It's up to you. You can kind of approach Eureka however you find most enjoyable. You'll have to raise your elemental level by killing weak enemies and then build it up. On top of that, there's the Magia board, which allows you to... Um, change your attributes around so you can uh, take on certain enemies with certain advantages or overcoming certain disadvantages you may have had otherwise. So again, reiterating stuff we kind of already knew. Um, also that you'll be losing elemental level experience points when you're above elemental level 6. They said they might cut that in the live letter before the, it actually comes out, but for now let's just assume you can lose experience points. However, if you're raised via a spell, then you won't lose experience points. It's only if you return to the home point that you actually lose experience points. Um, one other detail that's here regarding Eureka is if an enemy detects you in Eureka, it's never going to let you go. So if you don't want to piss something off, stay away from it because you're not getting away from it, at least not safely, once that thing is on you. You better call people over and be like, hey, 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 I'm running this thing in a circle. Please, does anyone want to come help kill? Please, I don't want to lose it. Or please res me. Um, so it's going to feel a lot more, and as they make the comparison here, kind of like Final Fantasy XI. Obviously, there's going to be some modernizations. Uh, there are notorious monsters there, but they make use of things like Final Fantasy XIV systems, such as Fates, to make it so everyone can participate in fighting these bosses. So you're not going to be competing for notorious monster claims, like, oh, I attacked it first, it's mine. Not going to be any of that old school stuff, but otherwise it is going to have a very old school feel to it but with the added effect of working towards your new relic weapon and relic armor, which the armor is the big one. There will be more additions to new zones where the weapon will be made even more powerful in the future. And uh, in terms of the strength of the weapon itself, it's relative to the patch it's released in. Um, obviously, right when Sigma Scape launches, Sigma Scape's weapon will be the best. Wait till 4.3, the new ultimate weapon will be the best. Will there be a point where this weapon is the best? It's never entirely said, but you know what? It will continue to grow. You will continue to progress through it in future patches. So if you look forward to building something over the course of the next year or so, this will be the thing for you to look out for. Moving forward, uh, he talks about the Jade Stoa and Biako a little bit. Talks about their personalities and how they've lined up some really cool cutscenes for the Four Lords story that's going to be coming. 
Um, the, along the fights, along the lines of Nidhogg, uh, this is more of a fight to conquer the soul. All four of them will be violent battles of conquest. So there's, they're basically much more interesting characters is what I'm taking from this. It's not just the tiger. It's not just the bird, as we've seen in the trailer. These are beings that have this innate need to conquer. So they are going to be very threatening. And hopefully the cutscenes that they're promising are actually really good. Thank you. But anyway, <laughs> um, they're very different from Final Fantasy XI. But I, I personally am a fan of it not just being a tiger. So as someone who played XI, I did the four gods in XI and all that. I'm glad it's not just a tiger, because that actually, yeah, I thought would have been pretty boring, so. Um, the dog, uh, the dog is still a mount. Byako himself is not the mount, just as a little reminder there. It has nothing to do with Aroa. Tenzin, he's not going to say anything about that, because Tenzin was name-dropped on the 4.2 website, so he's not going to say much. And then there's just a few other things here. The elephant that you get from the Ananta is going to be able to fly, of course. Um... On top of that, the uh, the war horses from the three grand companies are going to be able to fly. And he basically just says that there's a lot of mounts and mount changes that are going to be coming in the patch. So uh, he thinks that mounts are the highlight of patch 4.2. <laughs> He's not wrong. I want that match tech fall. Then he talks about the Sigma scape. And there's a few interesting details in here as well. The focus is going to be on Midgard Sormer this time around. And after that, on Nero's coolness. So there's going to be a good variety here. They talk about how Nero and how popular he's become, but then they start talking about Omega itself. He doesn't want to spoil too much about the Kefka fight, but he just says, Omega's got a an interesting imagination. So please look forward to it. In regards to uh, Omega, um, there's not going to be anything like Nail in the ultimate fight where you have to read text. He just wants to let you know Nothing will work like Nail worked in the ultimate encounter for uh, the unending coils. So then we move on. Um, he talks about the difficulty of the battles. This is a big topic because everyone keeps saying, you know, it's going to be like Delta Escape. It's going to be dead super quick. Here is what Yosh Yoshida himself had to say. He thinks the first battle will be completed easily. However, it is more difficult when compared to Altroit, the first battle in Delta Escape. Delta Escape was specifically developed with the premise that people weren't completely familiar with level 70 skill rotations, so they considerably dropped the difficulty. This time, since everyone's already familiar, things will be a bit more challenging. When you ask how it is compared to past bosses taking into consideration the average skill level of all players has improved over time, it's about the same with the current players now as Delta was with players back when level 70 was first figured out. So if you're a player who figured out your job before Delta Escape came out, which honestly, let's be honest, there were plenty of people who weren't uncomfortable with their jobs when Delta Escape came out, then you'll probably feel that this is better in terms of the encounters, but that it's still ultimately a challenge that's probably beneath what your, in, what your skill level is. For the players who kind of take their time and figure things out gradually, it may feel like a bit of an increase. The statement that it's similar to Delta Escape and difficulty is based on relative comfort and skill with the jobs and how it's developed since uh, Delta Escape came out like six, seven months ago. I think for that reason, it is fair to say that this actually will be a harder tier. It's going to come down to the type of player you are and what kind of challenge. If you took on Ultimate, I think we all knew this, this will be a joke to you. That's the bottom line. Yeah, it might throw you for a few loops, you'll have to learn things, but it ultimately sounds like, and as expected, it will be a joke to you. So, please enjoy, as he says, world firsting it in under two days. He says, just like last time, I expect it to be world firsted in about two days, in two days or less. Um, he's not that he thinks that they're easy, it's just that he knows the world first people, the people who took on ultimate, he knows that there's no way this could stand up to that. He knows. He says that it's really going to be the ultimate series where those players are challenged and where those players are really striving and pushing themselves to the next level. Uh, there's one highlight from Sigma Escape. There's one that's a bit of a brain test, and it seems that he's specifically referring to the third boss, the Guardian. Um, it will be more difficult than the third battle from last time. He said, I personally think it's a bit more difficult. The third fight this time is unlike the one last time, but it was fun to develop, so please enjoy trying to figure out the mechanics. They make mention of the Guardian and how he has the pixel mechanics on the screen in the back. And then he says it'll be even trickier and savage. And he doesn't want to say anything more. 
just that Savage, those panels on the back are going to be a lot trickier, and the mechanics for Guardian are going to be a lot trickier when you do it on Savage. So, with that out of the way, um, they talk about the art, why they picked the art for the 4.2 thing. Uh, that's whatever. It's not bad. They got the uh, creator of the Chocobo design from Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon to help them out. And that's because Alpha. Alpha in his Garland Ironworks outfit. He's a boss. I love Alpha. I want an Alpha minion. Please give me an Alpha minion. Um, Alpha's still vaguely defined in the world. With Sigma Scape and further towards the final stage, please expect to learn more about Alpha. And then they talk about uh, balance adjustments and their approach towards certain jobs. For example, um, their first rule of thumb they reiterate is that they want to raise power. But at this point, they've hit a ceiling where they literally just can't keep raising power for jobs that are already performing somewhat well because eventually it's going to just snowball out of control and all the jobs are going to be way stronger than they are intended to be at this point in the game. Um, basic policy um, at this point put us a little bit for over, uh, overall inflation. So this is going to be the patch where they suppress certain jobs. Paladin's a big one because it's got crazy utility and crazy good damage right now. So they are going to be the ones that are going to be knocked down just a little peg. Translations hinted that Shield Swipe and Holy Spirit specifically would be seeing potency nerfs. He also talks about how um, Warriors have been on the rise. More and more people have been playing Warrior. He's surprised to see more people playing Warrior than Dark Knight. You're surprised why? I'm going to let him have that one. Um, but anyway, then they start talking about, like, you know, how so many people are using Paladins, and how Paladins can be any spot, and how Paladins are good in the off-tank off spot. He just talks about how good Paladins are, pretty much for a bunch of the time here. Um, also talks about getting rid of Protect, because it's kind of just, it's nice to have in the game. It's something healers can do, and it's something healers are recognized for, but at the same time, it would make things so much simpler if we just didn't have Protect in the game. It's something that they always have to expect is there, 100% of the time. So it just becomes an extra calculation because there's no point where they're ever like, oh, well, you know, we're not going to design this fight to be beaten without Protect because everyone's going to bring Protect and then it's going to be a joke. So now we have to design it. You, you, I think you understand the dilemma here. I personally wouldn't mind seeing Protect hit the, hit the, the road, but eh, it is what it is. The, they'll do what they do and I either have Protect or I don't. So just uh, please, please give me Protect. All right. So then they talk about the structure of tournament for the feast. This one's really weird because they still are talking about feasts and esports. <sighs> do I, do I, have, should I break it to them that like, it's probably not happening. <laughs> uh, finally, being in a system which allowed to become an esport. Are you planning on forming something like a pro league? He says, I haven't thought that far out. They should be able to do it, but this is mainly a PvE MMO, so they'd like to go step by step with this one, because if players aren't motivated to do it um, after they set up the official tournaments, then it's probably not worth doing. So worry about the official tournaments for now, and then if a pro league falls into place, it falls into place. Uh, but they're going to be holding tournaments on a regular basis. They want to make them exciting, um, but they don't want to do things too quickly, because then it'll just fall over. Um, they want to grow the population of PvP steadily, and it has been growing since A Realm Reborn, um, but they're working on the tournament rules and stuff like that. Uh, they're going to be holding official tournaments, so uh, official games be held at FanFest. Um, uh, they just said they'll let you know once they confirm it. And then he talks about a few of the issues. He just wants to confirm a few things before he says that definitively there's going to be official games held at FanFest. Uh, Small-scale PvP it seems like the bar for entry uh, players that don't get in from the beginning. Tactic gets further established over time and Threshold can feel very high for beginners. They get a lot of feedback about beginner support in PvP and uh, it's something he wants to focus on. He says that it's it's definitely way too tough for beginners to get into, specifically, the Feast. Uh, are there any plans to get players involved who haven't been in the past, like New Campaign? Uh, mostly re uh, it'll at most be rewards like collaboration equipment or mounts. Uh, I'm not thinking any sort of campaign. PvP is really about competition has to have a good, and uh, it has a good following. I think it's counterproductive to make those who don't want to participate feel like they have to. Also, for everyone who plays PvP, the goal is to be the best. It's not something about equality. I've played PvP in a lot of games, but the feeling of winning should be the reward. It's no good if you're forcing people to make efforts to try and win. That doesn't work. In that regard, it's the same for forming statics at PvE, so we'd like to loosen up the bar for entry into the feast, but please give us some more time. A lot of people have gotten into rival wings, uh, so it's be interesting to see what happens when they update the feast. Um, they're going to watch the games and see how the teams are doing, and it's going to be fun. 
Keep an eye on all this number one goal, making players feel like they want to try it out. There are players who started in 4.0 and have already cleared Ultimate Bahamut, so I don't think there's much disadvantage of getting started playing. Will you have Rival Wing tournaments? No. Teams of 24 are ridiculous. So, no. <laughs> Just no. Uh, have any thoughts about making 8v8 Rival Wings? Uh, they said no. Um, Add a responsibility of having less players. I think the fun would all but disappear. I think he's got, at least he's got his, his, his fingers on the pulse a little bit for Rival Wings. Not to push that further than where it is already. Let it be, bounce it out, and then, you know, just give us that next Seal Rock map, because we love that one. Uh, submarines will be easier to make than airships. Do I even need to read those? If you did made a free company airship for the old content, then the submarine, which functions similarly, will be a little bit easier to make. Uh, the story for the future will be announced at FanFests. There's no surprise for that. Um, what, do you, what can we say? Expansions get announced. That's what FanFests are for. They're for announcing expansions. Um, I don't know. I'm sure I'll give a keynote speech discussing the future of 14. The content might be about an expansion or maybe 4.8. <laughs> but everyone's going to take that comment about 4.8 super seriously. Like, I'm, or, I'm actually afraid because he made it seem like it was worth announcing 4.8 at the FanFest, which almost implies they've already announced 4.6 and 4.7. So I can't wait to see how that gets twist turned upside down. Uh, let's take a moment, just sit right there. I gotta read the rest of this. Uh, let's see. You can say they're working on it. Uh, what's it called? Are you already divided? Are you already divided with the team for the expansion and one for 4.0? Uh, they don't have separate development lines. After talking to the World of Warcraft team, I thought we might decide to do so, but I couldn't figure out a good way of dividing the team, so we decided to continue on this road. The speed of creating graphical resources is different, so it should be quite different. Oh, so it's weird that they specifically asked the World of Warcraft team how they approached development of a new expansion and new patches simultaneously. World of Warcraft, we like to meme on them a lot. Let's be honest though, in terms of raid content and pushing out patches, Legion at the very least has been an improvement. Obviously when it came to previous expansion launches with the long, long waits, like the over one year waits between a final patch and an, and an expansion, those were problematic. But with Legion, at least so far, it's been a little bit better. We'll have to see how it actually pans out as people wait for Battle of Azeroth. Moving back into Final Fantasy XIV, uh, let's see. Development of the expansion happens in the free time. Uh, depends on which group of staff. When we released 4.0, we decided on how to do the next expansion in the general outline. We developed the content and the updates in parallel with milestones through the end of 4.x and reviewed by leaders of all teams. Sometimes things will get moved around. Beyond that, between me and the scenario team, we decided on the framework of the next expansion during the development of 4.1. After that, I worked together with the management team to allocate the work. Since the plan for the patch series has already been fleshed out, my job with the patches is mainly to confirm the detailed specs for each patch and to play check. For the rest of the time, it's to look at maps, confirm layouts, and order the artwork for each location. And then they just they just go like robots. They just do it over and over again. Um, the Japan Fan Festival would be in March. He actually wanted to hold it in December. Wow. November and then December. Wow, that's uh, crazy. They couldn't work it out. Despite looking for venues a year and a half before the event, they couldn't get the schedule and location to work out. They thought about Osaka. They thought about a few locations. It, if we do something like a dome, the scale's too big. So it was it was difficult. Um, we'll be announcing the details. We're waiting on information for each region. Uh, the next phase will be the global online producer, who is the general director of the FanFest, flying to each site and summarizing the plans. Seems like there'll be a battle for tickets once again. Uh, from the administrative side, it's a pleasure to see that, but it's stressful for players. It'd be great if everyone who wanted to come could come, but the scale becomes really challenging. We want those who show up to feel like they want to participate again in the future. This August, the Realm of Born is five years old, and it will be eight years since the original release. <laughs> You're still getting a lot of new players, and people think 14 is getting better after each large-scale implementation. I'd like to plan something as part of that. There are warriors of light in Japan and all over the world, so it's easier. it becomes easier to organize and plan various things. Then he has one last closing message. In 2017, we implemented a new expansion that saw many new and returning players. After four years of service, last year was both our most profitable year and our largest improvement yet, with everyone's support. We'd like to make another leap forward this year while saving the strength for the future and really do something different and interesting with 14. Not just with patches, but also with 14 content events. I think this will be a year that players can enjoy activities inside and outside the game. We'll be starting this all off with patch 4.2 that we'll release on January 30th. I think the way things develop will be quite unpredictable based on past... Why do you think it'll be unpredictable now? I can't remember the last time I made a prediction about a patch. And I was wrong. 
<laughs> and it has nothing to do with being on the pulse. It's been predictable, so I don't know how it would be unpredictable based on past events. Maybe it's unpredictable compared to past events. There's going to be a lot of surprises. Check it out. Discuss what might be coming next. There's a great variety of content this time, so please enjoy it. Overall, good interview. There's some other interviews I'm still waiting on translations for, but this one, some interesting details to take from that. So with that, let's wrap up the video. If you have any thoughts on what you just read here, be sure to put them in the comment section of the video below. And be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. We got patch notes coming this weekend. We got the patch coming next week. We got raids, raid guides. You guys know the drill. It's going to be awesome. And I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences with all of you. Thank you for watching. And until next time, take care.